This is Science of the Movies, and we're going to blow you away. First stop, Narnia. And I've got a sweet ride to get there. There you go. <laughs> yeah, bring it! And the funky crew at Creature Effects unleashes a party animal. Yeah, yeah, get down, get funky. We'll meet an Oscar-winning effects expert who controls the weather. Well, that's 15 miles an hour, Narnia. 15 jump, miles? Please. Yeah. Just be careful not to tick them off. Ow! I thought movies were supposed to be fake. Then, would you like to meet Emily? I don't know. What do you think? I know I would. Too bad she's not real. She was cooked up in this digital Frankenstein's lab. When I think of, like, cutting-edge technology, yeah. these are the kind of things I picture in my head. Finally, can a bus fly? We'll check the science behind the movie Speed. I don't like Keanu's chances here. And learn the totally gnarly secrets behind the stunt. We actually did the jump for real. Saddle up. It's Science of the Movies. Yeah. People say that working with children and animals is such a big issue. I just don't see the problem with it. I guess it's because I'm a natural, you know, I'm such a nurturing guy. <gasps> Luckily, this is a highly realistic but fake baby provided by Creature Effects. The name says it all. These guys have built amazing creatures for major blockbusters. Well, here's the baby, safe with Uncle Nar. This little bundle of silicon came from Bob Newton, the Creature Effects production coordinator. <laughs> the realism in this little guy is just absolutely phenomenal. Oh, thank you. The head is a lot heavier. It's really like a real baby. Mm -hmm. And I always wondered, you know, when you see uh, babies, like uh -huh. really like newborn babies right. on film, where are they coming from? <laughs> you know what I mean? They, they, do use, they do use live babies on set. One of the reasons that we create the the animatronic babies to replace the live babies is that it becomes more cost effective to production to, to use our babies. More quiet as well. They are. They're very low maintenance. And there's there's no union for silicone-based fake babies. That's correct. Okay, these babies are so realistic, they're creeping me out a little. And all the creature effects critters have that same attention to detail, whether they move or not. Uh, the idea is to create the, the illusion of reality. An animatronic animal has uh, mechanisms inside of it that actually make it move to replicate the movement of, a, of an animal, of a living creature. What, what would you call it if it's not animatronic? Well, we call it a, a, a stunt animal or, or a stuffy. Um, a stuffy? Really? Yeah. You call it a stuffy? Yeah. The stuffies are used when you need to pose an animal in the background or in a dangerous situation where you don't want to risk injuring a real animal or expensive animatronics. Tell me about this guy. Is he fully animatronic? It yeah. looks like he has like 6,000 wires going in there. Well, it's got a lot of different functions in it. It's got uh, body movement, uh, the arms and wrists move, the uh, full head and neck movement, and a lot of uh, features in the face will move as well. This beaver has starred in lots of TV commercials with a little help from some friends. All right, so these are the joysticks for the beaver, huh? Yeah, these are all the controls for the beaver, including these radios. Okay, I only need about four more arms, right? Well, we could get some more guys in here to operate this stuff. Bob and I are going to get an assist from the Creature Effects crew. Matt, a special effects artist, mechanical designer Todd, and Mark Rappaport, owner and founder of Creature Effects and today a beaver ventriloquist. So take me through this. Exactly how do these work? It's uh, what we call a pull-pull cable system. Cables connected to mechanisms inside the beaver run through a pulley system controlled by these crazy joysticks. You're pulling on one side of the spool to move uh, one way and pulling on the other side of the spool to, to move the other. So you have kind of the gross body movement there. Okay. Um, I'll be operating uh, the head and neck movement. Todd's operating the arms. Uh, Matt's operating some of the facial features and Mark's operating the, the, the jaw and some of the other facial features. Now. Are those different back there, the, the ones that you guys are operating there remotely? They are different. They're, you know, the remote controlled radio boxes. It's the same thing you would buy at a, say, if you wanted to fly a helicopter, we just take them and we change them to work for us. You mod them so that now they're working servo motors in the face? Is that? That's right. Whoa, he just came to life, didn't he? <laughs> oh, he looks like he's waking up. Can we make it look like he's waking up? Oh, yeah, big yawn there, yeah. 
Because can we make them maybe, uh, maybe uh, look afraid? Yeah, let's try it. So what will we do? Give us a one, two, three. One, two, three. <laughs> oh, it's just you. Mars, it's good to see you. It's nice to meet you. Here, here's what's great about that. No one communicated with each other at all. We just all knew exactly what we were going to do. There you go. You're a natural. Now that I'm in sync with the gang, it's time to try out some serious moves with this guy. And... Oh. Yeah, yeah. Get down. Get funky. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. All right. Now you see a chick across the club that you're totally digging. Ready? And go. This beaver kicks butt. Oh. But I'm ready to see where they build the big ticket practical effects. Whoa! This is our workshop. These are the horses. Yeah. Oh my gosh, it looks so real. These horses are perfect replicas down to the smallest detail, except for the missing lower half. I'm petting it like it's a real horse. <laughs> it's just coming to me naturally. The hides are actually made out of artificial fibers. Only the manes and the tails are real horse hair. The eyes and teeth are custom made right down to the nasty grass stains. Tell me about the differences between these two horses. Well, this is an animatronic horse, and this is a static horse. But we can put a rider on here, a jockey on here, and actually have them uh, pull on the reins and affect so movement it, in the horse's head it's out. It's more like a, like a puppet. You can get movement out of it, but it's manipulated by whoever's sitting on it. Right, exactly. A static horse like this big fella is used when a horse takes a nasty spill on camera. Unlike the battle days when productions would put real horses in real danger. It's very convincing when you see those on film and you see them flipping over like in the right. battle sequences or whatever. Yeah. And you're like, oh my gosh, the horse just broke its neck. Well, fortunately, we're able to do that with these instead of real horses. Very humane. When a filmmaker needs a shot with hyper-realistic movement, this animatronic beauty comes out of the stable. We would use these in a situation where either uh, the person who's on the horse has no experience riding, or they have fear of horses. This horse was specifically built for Georgie Henley to ride in um, Narnia Prince Caspian. This creature effects test footage shows they could convincingly sell the idea that this little girl is handling a lot of horsepower. What we were able to do was have her ride at a very rapid pace. Yeah, and she's looking back a lot. Yeah. There's a lot of action for her to do as well. Right. So did the horse just move up and down, or how did it move along the road then? Um, well, this horse has, has the movement that you're showing here, where the, 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 the rocking and the head movement. It also has musculature underneath. In order to see the muscles in action, beaver maestro Todd, who helped design the horse, is going to bring his creation to life. And here we go. Oh, my gosh. So the, what we've done is to, is to recreate the muscles actually moving underneath the skin. It's, it's musculature here. It just the way that it moves is just so realistic. Yeah. Well, the, there's there's forms under there that are uh, being driven by the motor to replicate that that muscle movement. The understructure is a framework of moving aluminum parts driven by a motor. Muscle-shaped forms made out of spandex and stuffing are attached to the moving parts, making that rippling effect under the skin. So tell me about how you achieve this movement with the rocking of the neck here. This would be, uh, this movement would be performed by an operator behind the horse with a lever attached to the horse, and he would m make that movement in sync with the musculature so that uh, the horse looks like everything's, you know, working together. Looks great on film, and if a little girl can ride this robo horse, why not me? So, Bob, you think I could uh, take her for a ride? Oh, absolutely. Really? Yeah, I think we better take it outside if we're gonna do that. Uh, <sighs> I'm glad your animatronic horse doesn't really kick. All right, I'm gonna have you spin it around. Yeah. Take it back to the forklift. Back. Often on big shoots like Sea Biscuit or Narnia, the horse would be mounted to a trailer pulled by a truck. But today, we're going for the convenience and breakneck 10 mile per hour speed of a forklift. I think I can get some good speed on this. I hope so. We can sell the shot, really. We're gonna try and throw you off the horse at the end. Okay. Watch yourself, but oh, All right. just oh. pulled my groin. Ah. All right, now that? the horse is gonna be rocking back and forth, so you're just gonna go with it. There you go. <laughs> yeah, bring it. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna start the forklift. Okay, but there's just one more thing that I need. Well, what's that? Time to put the gnar in Narnia. Follow me, fellow geeks. For today, we roll natural 20s! <laughs> <laughs>
Next up, I'm weathering the elements. My shoes are wet! In an effects gauntlet of wind and hail straight out Ow. of the movie Twister. Look at this piece of ice! And later, find out how two companies teamed up to make the most realistic CG character ever. I've seen this several times, and it still absolutely blows me away. I'm Fritz Coleman in the Weather Center with your 5 o'clock weather update. But first, let's get a look at the weather in the greater Los Angeles area with our field correspondent, Nara Williams. Thanks, Fritz. I'm here at beautiful downtown Burbank. We're experiencing a unique meteorological phenomenon known as a sun shower. Really coming down out here, man. OK, fine. We're actually at Effects Birds, where I'm going to speak with the guy who's hosing me down right now. Hey, John, can you turn off the rain? My shoes are wet. If you need a jaw-dropping practical effect, call on Oscar-winning special effects master, John Frazier. He's the man behind some of the best bad weather movies in the business, like Twister. Thanks for having me here. Absolutely. So uh, I'm here to learn about how you create a variety of weather effects sure. for, for film, mm -hmm. starting with, well, rain. Do you want the raindrops to be big or small? Or, I we imagine want the raindrops to be big for the big shots, because what happens is when they're small, that's like a mist. And when that mists out, we don't see you on camera. It has to be backlit. It's like when you're watching a football game. And when the players are on the field, you don't see that it's raining. But when the camera pans up to the, to the lights, you see how much it's raining. So that's a cameraman's job, is he will light the rain for us. OK. Our responsibility is to get the raindrops the right size and the right velocity. Making fake rain is a complicated business, but then so is the real thing. In nature, rain forms when water vapor in a cloud wraps around tiny particles like dust or sea salt. When clouds get crowded, these guys start bumping into each other, forming larger drops. When one gets heavy enough, it falls. For the team at experts, getting rain right is a juggling act of pressure, volume, and velocity. We go more for volume than we go for pressure. When you start adding pressure, that's when it misses out again. Okay. Let's say if you're at 80 pounds per you know per square inch, uh -huh. that's a good that's a good pressure. Okay, so 80 psi is the ideal pressure. Uh, now, what kind of volume are you talking about? I see you have a big fireman's hose here. That actually for us, that's a small hose. Oh, really? Yes, a normal rain job where we're using a 100 foot rain bar pumps out about a thousand gallons a minute of, rain, of water. When we did Pirates of the Caribbean, uh, part three, we were pumping out at around, just around 75,000 gallons a minute, Where which does... we could recycle, by the way. OK. We, we just had a continual reuse of that water. It takes a whole lot of foot-wide hoses to tackle waterworks like that. To get all that water flowing naturally, effects raise the bar, literally. Up to 25 years ago, you can see in the background here, we have this what's called a rain stand. And it, it only goes up about 20 feet which means that now you're limited to your, your arc of your rain coming out. Unlike your shower head, which pushes out water in an arc, real rain comes straight down, a key detail to making plausible precipitation. So we came up with this rain bar concept where we can raise the rain bar with a crane as high as we like, get the rain straight. The rain bar can be raised up to 100 feet high, so they never have to worry about the drops arching from the head and it's got up to six spigots for Effexpert's customized rain heads. That's one type of head that we use, it's called a spinner. If you get any kind of uh, little small debris in that head, it stops spinning. Now, why, why is that? Just it Well, because up? it just clogs up the bearings and we're not allowed to spin. So that's not my favorite tool there. It may be finicky, but the spinner's great if you only need showers in a small area, like, say, on your TV host. But what is my favorite tool? Something we call a goose drowner. And it's a term that's been used. It's called for a what? Goose drowner is an old time term for a serious rainstorm. And the heavy duty head was actually invented 50 years ago for industrial chemical baths. When you use the goose drowner head, uh -huh. it gives you full coverage. That's more important than it is actually the rain falling, is what you see on the street. 
What other weather will I be experiencing today, John? Yeah, we're gonna do some hail like we did in Twister. Hail? What the hail is hail anyway? And how does it occur in nature? Cue legendary LA weathercaster Fritz Coleman. Hail, tiny frozen droplets of water that get thrown around inside a thunderstorm cloud with very severe updrafts. And it kind of ends up like an onion where there's a layer of water that freezes and another layer of water that freezes. And finally, the hailstorm gets so heavy that it falls out of the cloud. To make hail for 1996's Twister, John and company had to invent a machine that would mimic Mother Nature. We went to a plastics, plastics company in Los Angeles, and they tried to help us out, make little cubes of hail, and which they could do. But the biggest problem that we had with, with that is, number one, it was very expensive, and number two, the cleanup. You have to collect it all. You got to collect it all. You got to get rid of it. Right. And so we thought, you know what? Why don't we just try to make real hail? The great thing about it is not only did it look good, was it just goes away. So it is just water. It's just ice. There's it's no chemical ice. or no anything chemical, else. No chemical, nothing. What about CGI? Is, is CGI taking over this kind of thing, or is there still use for the real hail? As great as the CG uh, instrument is, it's just better when it's live, especially when it's hitting you on the head or, or it's raining and that water is running off your umbrella. John's practical effects force actors to get in character fast. Now he's going to recreate a scene from Twister, hopefully without the Twister. You're not going to sissy up and hide behind me, are you? Nothing? No, okay. I'm tough. All right, we're going to see how tough you are. Here, Here it comes. comes. Huh? Ow! Ow! These are big chunks of ice, what is John. Isn't that great? And you don't have to clean it up. I thought movies were supposed to be fake. I can't believe that we're, we're in the middle of Burbank. It's a sunny day, and I got big chunks of ice raining down on me. Now, this is what we did for three months in the wheat fields of Oklahoma. Look at these <laughs> Look at this. That's huge. So how do they make this hellish hail so convincing? Say hi to Pete DeGrandis. Hey, right. Pete. How you doing? Pete supplied John with about 60 tons of ice to create the hail and twister. Whoa, that's a lot of ice. How much ice did you bring today? About five tons. You brought five tons yeah. of ice? Yeah. Wow. There's two parts to this. The first part is a chain that's got some pullers on it that'll get back behind the ice and pull it in to this crusher. You got a big drum here with big teeth. Whoa. And it will crush the ice down into big shards, big pieces. That, that's some wicked medieval looking spikes you got yeah, in there, big... man. This industrial snowblower was invented as a way to fill box cars and boats with ice to keep produce and fish cold. And it can make anything from golf ball sized hail to a dainty snowflake. As the ice enters this, this port through here, the impeller will literally pulverize the ice down to snow. So we'll, we'll regulate the size of the snow or hail, like you saw earlier, Ow! by the speed of the motor. So to get the hail, we would just run it at a low RPM, uh -huh. okay, and it doesn't break it down as much. And then to get snow, then we'll just scream the engine. That's when it pulverizes it down to fine snow. Speaking of getting pulverized, stick around. The forecast calls for a carbon dioxide fog storm. It, it's safe to breathe? Absolutely. And we'll find out if I can survive a Category 2 hurricane. We're hanging out with practical effects god John Frazier to see how he and his team have mastered the elements for movies like Twister and The Perfect Storm. So far, I've been drenched with rain Ow! and pelted by hail. Next up, turn on your low beams. It's fog. Fog is basically a cloud that sits on the ground, formed when humid air cools. So how do you make a cloud? I haven't the foggiest. The low-lying ground fog is done with, with uh, liquid uh, CO2. The spooky cemetery fog is created by sending oil-based fog fluid through a heating element where it turns into a vapor, kind of like an oil leak on your exhaust pipe. It's then super cooled by liquid carbon dioxide, which makes it hug the ground. 
But to create a thick, all-up-in-your-face effect, they hit it with another handy tool. Oh, wow, it's a, it's a little fog gun. Yeah, what this actually is is a bug sprayer that's converted over to motion picture work. This is just chunks of uh, uh, dry ice. This is dry like, ice right here. Know, solid CO2 there. So you're spraying hot oil over the, the uh, dry ice. Yes, sir. Kind of blends in with the ground fog. So that's for the kind of the more mid-air fog. Right, right. Okay. Right. What situations would you use this in? Can you use it outside? Will it we last use it outside? outside? We use it outside. The only thing that hurts us outside, of course, is um, is, is the wind. Mm -hmm. So when the winds get up to you know, 10, 15 miles an hour, then we don't generally make ground fog or fog at all because it, it tends to just look like, like a fire or smoke from a fire and not fog. Those little sprayers are great for fogging up a room, but what if you've got acres to fill? Bust out this vinyl bad boy. It can reach over 200 feet long and has been used in movies like Pearl Harbor and Transformers. Take that knife and just make a little slit in it. Like here? Yeah, just like that. Okay, that's good. The tube is inflated with high volume air and they control the output by making as many razor slits as they need. Instead of having that one hose kind of one source of fog, you're allowed to lay this out over a large area. We can lay this out for, for acres. And have a nice steady stream of fog. Exactly, exactly. So you guys developed this here at FXperts. Jim Schwamm, my set coordinator, actually years ago uh, developed this and it's become the standard of the industry and everybody uses it. Fantastic. Yeah, it works real well. How long has this technology been around? Is this relatively new or is it old? Well, actually what we used to use is what they call rumble pots. And they were big drums and they would take hot water, boil the hot water, and then they'd have a basket full of dry ice. Mm -hmm. And then you just take that basket of dry ice and you slowly drop it into the hot water and it does the same thing. This is just a lot more safer and it's just um, a lot easier to use than having a bunch of hot water laying around the stages. Sure. Um, speaking of safety, with this tube smoke, the ground fog, and that little gun they used, we've been hanging in this CO2 drenched room for at least half an hour. How come we're still standing? What we'll do a lot of times is like with that, with the dry ice and stuff, they'll add oxygen to it because I know everybody's concerned about passing out because we're taking the oxygen out of the air. Yeah, I feel totally fine. It doesn't Well, what even... they do is they add oxygen to the tanks. Uh, what's happened in the to last the CO2 years, tank? To the tanks, exactly. And that doesn't affect the quality of the Not smoke at all? at all? Not at all. Huh. Not at all. All right, you want to go get some fresh air? Let's do that, Nar. By the way, when I said get some fresh air, kind of an understatement. Wow, these are not your average desktop fans, John. No, these will, these will make some wind, baby. We know it blows, but what is wind anyway? Boys and girls, legendary LA weatherman Fritz Coleman. Wind is caused by air moving from areas of high atmospheric pressure to areas of low atmospheric pressure. For instance, when you pop an inflated balloon, the minute you stick the pin in, the air rushes out of the balloon. It's high pressure seeking lower pressure outside the balloon. So John, what is this fan called? This is a gas operated fan, which what I mean it runs on, this runs on a Chevrolet 502 cubic inch Chevrolet motor. Oh. It's a lot, about 500 horsepower. 500 horsepower. So that, this fan right here will put out 100 mile an hour wind at the tip of the blade. To put this puppy in perspective, 100 miles per hour is the equivalent of a category two hurricane or a tornado that could tear the roof off your house. This one right here is not directional. This one right here will, will pretty much take the wind and, sp and spread it around throughout the, the whole area. In now, case... when do you want to use that? Now, when do you want the effect that you want it in the whole area? Generally, most of the time you want that because okay. that way you can you don't have to use as many fans. Now, you guys build them here We build from the scratch? fans here, yes. Well, what we do is we find out what horsepower we're going to need for a specific movie. Okay. We're not trying to reinvent the wheel. We're just trying to make a better wheel. Okay. Pretty much. Bigger, better, more powerful? More powerful, right. The carbon fiber blades on this customized beast turn up to 5,000 RPMs, and the fan's powered by hydraulics, so an operator can tilt and pan by remote without getting blown away by any neighboring fans. Okay, now this one looks wicked. This kind of looks like almost like an airplane engine or something. Now, it also puts out 100 miles an hour wind at the, right here at the blade, but what it does is it's directional. So this has a lot of power and it's centralized and it's shooting out in one. That's right, Nari. This is also electric, so we can use these indoors. Oh, okay. Well, that's gas. It can only be used outside. This baby's perfect if you're far away from where the action's taking place or if you happen to be a certain blockbuster director all up in it. You'll see these on every Michael Bay movie 
where you won't see them, but this is the one we use. He loves these. Well, he uses a lot of helicopters in his movies, Helicopter so you need that wind in. effect on the right. ground, right? Well, he started using them on Armageddon. Yeah. And, uh, and we've used them ever since. Wow, that's awesome. Now, are there any, like, safety precautions to take? You know, I mean, because I imagine 100 miles per hour coming out of here directional, you know, you don't want to blow over your leading lady kind of deal? What we try not to do is, like, in a lot of scenes, they'll want to have debris in them. So what you don't want to do is you just don't want to have debris going through the blades and possibly being churned up and, and hitting somebody. The wind itself is not going to hurt you? The wind is not going to hurt you, no, no. So with that said... What kind of stupid question was that? Uh, I... Ow! Now that I feel super secure, let's shoot a little test scene of our own, shall we? Dashing show host goes for a morning stroll through the park with his coffee. Little does he know, a storm's a-brewing. Well, that's 15 miles an hour in our little gentle miles? breeze. Yeah. Yeah, it's a nice Feels little good, huh? gingerly piece. One. Is this a wrap? That's a wrap. New pair of socks, $8. Umbrella, $15. This is messing up my hair, John. Hairstylist, wow. $40. Spending an afternoon with someone who controls the weather, priceless. Coming up on Science of the Movies. One of the kind of the driving ideas of the Institute has been the, the holodeck on uh, Star Trek. We're beaming to the next generation of virtual reality. Mm, I've seen better. Get more Science of the Movies online. Check out sciencechannel.com slash science of the movies. You can be watching a CG animated film starring a tiny robot made out of a tin can and big binocular eyes, and it feels so cute, so human, even though it's obviously made of metal. And then you could be watching another CG animated film starring a ultra-realistic human character, and you totally get the heebie-jeebies. Yeah. There's a name for that creepy feeling. All right, Poindexter, enough lecturing. So what is the name of that creepy feeling? Is it A, Erie Canyon, B, Grim Gully, or C, Uncanny Valley? If you guessed C, you're right, and you win a date with Emily. Well, I think that they have Easy, guys, she's not real, but she is arguably the most convincing CG human to date. Mm, I've seen better. Ah, uh, she's so modest. So who are the Frankensteins behind the Emily Project? The Big Brains at USC's Institute for Creative Technologies, where they're pioneering CG and virtual reality in the fields of education and entertainment. Emily gets the star treatment around here, and Paul DeBevick is one of the mad scientists who helped create her. Where does that term uncanny valley come from? It comes from like some kind of graph, right? Right, there's a graph. Well, it's, it's a theory that was done by a Japanese roboticist named Masakoto Mori in the 1970s. Dr. Mori's experiments revealed that the more human a robot looks, the more people will empathize with it, up to a point. It turns out that if a robot only has a few human features, we'll notice the things we have in common with it. On the other hand, if they have too many, but not enough to totally convince us, we'll only pay attention to the things that are different, causing a sense of revulsion. That plunge in the graph is called the uncanny valley, and designers have been trying to bridge it for decades. I've talked to some visual effects supervisors who they say, like, I bought property in the uncanny valley. It's like, <laughs> been, I've been in there so long. Part of being in that uncanny valley, in that dip, means you're actually getting a lot of stuff right. Right. So some of the people who finally got us into the uncanny valley, even though that stuff creeped us out, it's what we had to do and what they had to achieve in order to get to the other side of it. What kind of applications are we talking about besides the 
entertainment aspect. One of the kind of the driving ideas of the Institute has been the, the holodeck on uh, Star Trek. Wait, did he just say the holodeck? As in the sweetest virtual reality simulator ever? And if you watch the holodeck, Oh, yes, he did. They use it in a ton of different ways. So, right. for example, uh, they use it to run, like, you know, a big military simulation in order to figure out how are we going to maneuver our enterprise in order to, you know, beat the Romulans in this episode. They use it for educational purposes so they can go and, you know, meet great scientists in their world. And they also, in fact, use it for entertainment. So all of those applications are what we're interested in. I think they all contribute to society. To get to the next generation of virtual reality, Paul developed a capture technology that looks like like it could be a set piece from the Enterprise itself. All right, so. Whoa. <laughs> oh my gosh, Paul. Dude, now, now when I think of like cutting edge technology, yep. these are the kind of things I picture in my head. W what is this? Well, this is something that today we call light stage five. It's basically the big ball of light. It's uh, what we use to scan faces. This light stage has been used by most of the major studios to capture famous mugs like Tobey Maguire's Spider-Man and Alfred Molina's Doc Ock. Step one in bringing CG Emily to life and finally bridging the uncanny valley was when real-life actress Emily O'Brien set foot inside this psychedelic pod. It sports 156 colored lights and 156 super white LEDs. The colored ones are used for recreating different lighting conditions. The white lights are used for the facial scans that make Emily look so real. Unlike motion capture, which recreates a subject's movement, ICT's system captures the play of light on skin using two cameras set up like a pair of eyes. Well, the process that we're set up for right now actually is designed to use almost just kind of prosumer level digital cameras. The reason we've got those is they can shoot about uh, eight or nine frames per second. And so the result is that we can shoot off about um, 15, 20 photographs of the face under different lighting conditions in about three seconds total. The quicker they shoot the images, the more natural facial expressions they can get from a subject. For Spider-Man 2, they took nearly 2,000 photos of Alfred Molina in a mere couple of hours. Three seconds per scan sounds pretty quick, so they won't mind if I hop in for a little test drive. Sorry guys, you won't be getting a digital host. It's in my contract. No green M&Ms, no Diet Dew, and no droid clones. Whoa, dude, I love that guy's hair. In the past, animators have often been limited to working with one neutral facial scan, like this pic, but from a couple different angles. There have been a lot of digital characters that were essentially based on, you know, a neutral scan of the face, and then you try to puppeteer that and move it into those positions based on motion capture. One thing that makes this project different is that Emily posed with 33 different expressions that basically comprise every muscle movement her face can make, allowing digital Emily to exist independent of the real Emily. It starts with what we call the, the diffuse lighting. The light that makes it underneath the surface, bounces around a little bit, gets skin colored, and then comes back out diffusely toward the camera. In order to get a diffuse image, they add polarizing screens to the cameras that block the reflection on her face. If we really pay attention to how the different colors of light are um, uh, diffusing differently, we can do a rendering that instead of looking like kind of a chalky plaster rendering, actually looks a lot like human skin. The diffuse images are great for recreating the depth and color of real skin. But as soon as your character starts moving, it's all about the light on the surface. These shots capture the shine of the light, or the specular reflection, on the face. They're used for seeing how skin texture changes when a face moves. You can really see those muscles underneath pulling down the skin. Absolutely. We can see some pretty amazing things that happen in the skin pores. Those detailed and subtle dynamics of what the skin does when it just bumps into itself. Those turn out to be very important for getting across the valley. OK, so we have the diffuse, and then we have the specular. Exactly. And, and is that it? Well, then the final thing that we do is we have these colored stripe patterns that start with um, very, very, very thin stripes and then go to thicker and thicker and thicker stripes. And as you can see, the stripes kind of drape along the contours of her face. The computer will see it in 3D, and that will give you the basic shape of the structure of you know, the nose and the forehead and the cheeks and all of that. 
Now, is that why you have the, I see that there are marks on her face here. Yep, absolutely. So the dots on her face uh, were there principally, first of all, so that in case she did drift or move a little bit during a scan, we could then compensate that motion back out and realign them based on where the dots went. But it's not as if it was the traditional motion capture approach in that you're putting points on a face and capturing those points in different expressions. You're absolutely right on that. So let me see if I can get this straight. By taking 15 frames, yep. you can get the light that's bouncing around under the skin. Yep. You can get the light that's only just that surface reflection on the skin and in the pores. Yep. And then you can also get a 3D ge geometrical shape of the face. Exactly. That's right, kids. You too can create your own X-Men villain lookalike. Step one, purchase your own light stage five. Some assembly required. Step two, take a shot in your light stage. Step three, pop a polarizer on your lens and take another shot. Step four, subtract the second shot from the first and voila, your own terrifying inner nargoyle unleashed. But like I said, you won't be getting an animated CG nar. So how'd they bring digital Emily to life? Once ICT gathered the data, they handed it off to facial animation gurus at Image Metrics, whose resume includes movies and video games like The Mummy 3 and Grand Theft Auto. They then had um, the exciting task of turning this into basically a rigged digital character that has uh, digital puppeteer controls so they can then raise the eyebrows, uh, open the mouth, move the jaw back and forth, uh, have her smile and frown and scowl. As you see as she moves around, she moves consistently with all of the shapes that we recorded yeah, in the that scans. We saw earlier. And that was the that was the whole idea. Before you apply those detailed textures and before you light it well, you know, that totally looks CG. I mean, that's yeah, uncanny like th valley. That is the typical video game character right there. Image Metrics animation rig and ICT's skin texture scans are living proof that the uncanny valley can in fact be bridged. But what Hollywood does with it once it gets to the other side is another story. So that's Digital Emily. I've seen this several times and it still absolutely blows me away. What does Emily think? I don't know. What do you think? I think my avatar just fell in love. After the break, we're testing out one of the gnarliest jumps in movie history. You had to go a certain speed and then stop before it blew up. It was a one-shot deal. Some of our favorite movies contain some sketchy science. Even though you love them, sometimes you look at an action scene and you can't help but think, that's bogus. That's right, it's time to break down some more movie science. Dudes, today we're gonna have the most excellent time finding out if the righteous, gnarly bus jump in the movie Speed was totally bogus or not. In this 1994 action flick, Sandra Bullock is piloting a bus booby rigged to explode if it goes under 50 miles per hour. When the bus encounters a break in a freeway overpass, she takes the advice of co-pilot Keanu Reeves, puts the pedal to the metal, and jumps the 50-foot gap. So, could a bus really do that? Or would the highway patrol be calling for a cleanup on aisle ouch? Okay, so this is the exact same type of bus that was used in speed. It's 35 feet long, and it weighs about 15 tons. Could it fly? I know just the man to ask. So I'm here with stunt coordinator from Speed, Gary Hines. Hey, Gary. Sir, please stay behind the white line. OK, but we're not moving. Safety first. He'd know. Gary's raced cars, tanks, trains, and boats for the likes of John Woo and Steven Spielberg. And today, he's going to help us figure out if that most triumphant bus jump could actually, like, happen in real life. Let's rev her up and try it out. No, people, not with this actual bus, with toys. First step, measure everything to scale, from the mini car to the gap. Oh, we're right about there. OK. That's pretty now, good. So that's the scale to the 50-foot gap that's actually in the movie. Correct. All right. Ready? Come on, Keanu. You got it in you, buddy. Ooh. Outlook not so good. But to be sure, let's get some hard science from a real engineer. The problem is, 
The moment that the roadway is no longer there to support the bus, gravity will start causing it to accelerate down. The horizontal speed of the bus is unaffected by gravity. There's a shot of the speedometer in the movie, the bus is going 67 miles per hour. At that speed, it'll travel the 50 feet in about half a second. I calculate that the distance the bus will fall is about four feet. Gary, our scientist says that because of that thing called gravity, that our bus is actually gonna fall four feet when it's in the air. So I thought we'd measure what four feet is on our bus here. So I'll hold this and just kinda. All right, over here. there's four feet. Four feet, right there. Okay, um, that's like right where Keanu and Sandra are. Pretty much. I don't like Keanu's chances here. I don't like any other chances. <laughs> so just gunning the bus on a flat roadway, not gonna fly. But what if it wasn't flat? In order to have any hope at all, the bus would need a takeoff ramp. The takeoff ramp is inclined upward, so a portion of the bus's velocity is going upward. This super high-tech slingshot looks like it'll do the job. Here we go, this is with the angle. Hey, Not look bad. at that landing. Pretty good. Our mini ramp worked like a charm. And according to Gary, they used something similar to get the shot in real life. We shot the jump using uh, an 80-foot ramp that was six feet high, and the bus flew 103 feet. There was always ground underneath it, but we actually did the jump for real. You actually did the jump for real. Yeah, you heard right. The gap might have been CG, but this big blue baby actually flew over 100 feet. It looks like we've scored a way to safety. All we need is a construction ramp of some kind, right? Um, the only problem is it took us two days and about 10 guys to assemble that ramp on the freeway. So if I'm going 50 miles per hour with a ticking time bomb, don't exactly have the prep time, exactly. is what you're saying. It would be an explosive situation. Denied. In fact, in the movie, there is clearly no takeoff ramp launching the bus. But what if the freeway itself was working with us? Now, is it possible that the freeway uh, would have a grade like this, enough of a grade to make yeah, a jump like I that? think it's doubtful. I think you would need to have some type of ramp. I'm not a stunt driver, but I agree. If the takeoff ramp is at five degrees, I calculate that the bus would travel in an arc that would carry it to safety. A uh, five degree ramp has a grade of 8.7%. The American Association of State Transportation and Highway Officials sets standards for the construction of freeways. One of these standards is that the grade of a freeway cannot be greater than 6%. A 6% grade is equivalent to a slope of 3.4 degrees. A 3.4 degree takeoff ramp is not enough to get the bus to the other side. Option three is definitely out. But are we out of options? What about speed? Not as in the movie title, as in miles per hour. According to our scientists, there is one way to make it work. Assuming a 3.4 degree slope, the bus would have to go at least 79 miles per hour. Bingo! The speedometer on our bus says it can go up to 80. We are home free, people. Or are we? One of our problems was, um, we found this out during filming, that the bus wouldn't go much over 55 and the ideal speed for the jump was 65, given that the distance we wanted to cover. After talking with the bus mechanic uh, for you know, some time and trying to find out what the maximum we could do of the bus, he came up with a plan that we could probably get maybe 64 miles an hour out of it. But there was a catch, the bus would probably only last. It would blow up after about two and a half miles. What? Yeah, it was running total loss and it was running really, really hot. You basically put yourself in the exact same position from the movie in that you had to go a certain speed and then stop before it blew up. It was a one-shot deal. Whoa, life was totally imitating art. So even if we floored it, it would be virtually impossible to get the max speed out of this 15-ton Titan. Put another way. Bottom line, everyone on the bus would die. It shouldn't be called speed. It should be called crash. Okay, the story says your bus is gonna explode if you stop, but the science says you're not gonna make that jump. Either way, don't count on a sequel. Unless it's, say, a boat. Nara, where are you? Johnny. Oh, Johnny. Get over here. All right, sound good, Mark? Gravy. Go, Joe. <laughs>
You're right there, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Abby, could you also download Kung Fu into my brain really quick? <laughs> <laughs>